Hi and welcome. I'm Tom, your host, and this is the Dropcast Movie Posted Podcast. This format is part of the Instagram blog Drop, and you can find us under @dropmakeofficial. We do reviews, news, and interviews that all have to do with the film business. And today we're going to talk to a highly underrated Joshua Budik. He's been part of the alternative movie poster scene for over a decade and has turned remarkable, memorable movie poster since. And so stay tuned. Head over to our Instagram profile at DropMacOfficial to follow along with the art we are talking about and or check us out on YouTube for the video version. So now let's get started. Welcome, Josh. How are you, man? Good. Hey, everybody. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> thanks for coming on. It's uh, it, it's been an honor. I, I, I have a couple of prints, as, as we already talked about here in the back. You can see the um, the, the Star Wars uh, Man, or the Mandalorian print. And I have the Totoro, which is in the back here. Um, uh, of our little uh, the background from the video and uh, a couple others and I did like b before we had before I had the interview I did like a little research on it and I was like wow he's been on for a long time I'm sorry I hope yeah. I hope you don't feel old now but <laughs> you've been you've been doing this for a while man and <laughs> tell right here this is like the last, last 12 years of poster work right there <laughs> uh, the, the clients were not nice I see <laughs> <laughs> but yeah yeah but yeah so, so you've done a lot of remarkable posters i didn't even know about right. and i really uh enjoyed uh, a lot like looking through all the portfolio stuff uh, you have on your website so if people check it out there's a lot of cool stuff going on and i had or i i, I didn't have to but i wanted to pick only three posters i wanted to talk right away about and this was a hard choice there were way too many and I try to pick, uh, I have an obvious choice. The first one I want to go with is the Spaceballs trilogy. Oh, jeez. Uh, <laughs> okay. So I, That's a great choice. I, I pulled that out. I mean, it's like if you compare it, obviously you have to compare it to the Ali Moss um, yeah, iteration of Star Wars. And um, this is, I think, this is what put uh, the alternative movie poster scene on the map and made it very important and... I wanted to know how how is your take on it? How how why did you come up with it? Or how did you come up with it? How 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 was it working license wise? Is it? It's it, it's not licensed. This is this was just a like gorilla print that okay. like I I've worked a lot with um, Nakatomi uh -huh. probably for the last eleven years. Um, I with Tim yeah. Doyle. Um, he and I have collaborated on quite a few things and he was looking to do a project and so we were brainstorming mm -hmm. one day and it just occurred to us we were like why don't we do a parody of a parody of a parody mm -hmm. and just see what people think and and of course Tim was totally gung-ho about it I had my reservations but I was like let me just see what I can work up and it was it just seemed to go naturally I mean the, the original post was by Ali mm -hmm. obviously they're so Iconic. Yeah, and a lot of people end up confusing my pieces with mm -hmm. his, which is funny. Yeah, but um, I people when we when we were going to release it, they were like, "What does Ollie think about this whole?" So one of my buddies actually wrote him. Yeah, and he wrote back and said, "You know, obviously in the spirit of art uh, and creativity, you know, he doesn't he didn't have a problem with it." Okay, I mean, it was like it was just one of those like natural kind of things that was bound to happen eventually yeah and i'm glad that we were the ones who thought of it <laughs> but yeah it was, a, it was a really successful set of three prints mm -hmm. i think people really got the message it resonated with them i think it was the right um subject matter to do kind of a parody print um yeah. and obviously the right subject matter to being a parody itself um so yeah. Did, uh, yeah. I mean, it, it was great. Those, those prints are the ones that I put out on on the table to display when I go to cons because yeah. it's just the colors are so bold and the imagery is so big mm -hmm. and easily recognizable that it just draws people in. Did did um, did you also get direct feedback from Ollie at, at some point or like later on? Um, I did not. Like okay. I've I've contacted Ollie a couple times uh, just asking about some technique stuff. Okay. And, He's been very forthcoming about, you know, some of the techniques that he uses. Um, just because I think um, his work, even though it's very iconic and clean, mm -hmm. it doesn't really have that um, vector type of feel to it. Mm -hmm. Like, it's not mechanical in its execution. It's it's very painterly. Yeah. So um, I was always curious as to, you know, was he using brushes? What was his technique? Mm -hmm. Was he 
doing it on paper first and then transferring it so that it had that hand-drawn feel. Um, so it's like, I think, um, yeah, starting out very early in my career where uh, I didn't know what I was doing. I had no <laughs> idea how screen printing worked. I, I've just been an illustrator my entire life, yeah. so I just didn't, I didn't go to school to be a screen print artist. So all of this has been learned. And early on, he was a very good example of uh, a talent to kind of strive for. And I, the way that he rep, the way that he boils subject mm. matter down to a very easily recognizable icon <laughs> uh, is masterful. He's he's just probably the best. Yeah, at it. and I just admire that. Very I, I'm much. a little sad that he turned to video games now <laughs> and just not doing posters anymore. Yeah, yeah. I think. Um, yeah, I don't know what the story about that is. I know that when his Batman piece came out and there was a huge fiasco about people like wanting it and then there was there ended up being uh, you know I, I believe there was just way more printed mm -hmm. than there yeah, should okay. have been so everyone tried to cash in yeah. basically on that poster just ended up being completely like everyone had it and everyone was getting rid of it then but I, I don't know maybe the industry just kind of soured to him or it just wasn't a challenge I, I would imagine it It wasn't a challenge yeah. anymore, and so moving on to a different subject matter. Um, I mean, it's hard to fault a guy for wanting to go into video of course games. Not. Yeah, I think of course it's not. a logical next step to, to take the drawings that we do and animate them or make them interactive. I think is is a great yeah. jump. All right, um, the next one I was uh, or I wanted to talk about is your Akuga Ninja Scrolls one. I really, really enjoyed that one. The Ninja Scroll one. You're talking about the one. Yeah, the one. exactly. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, what I, I that movie. Um, there's so much good subject matter. Yeah. Um, and it's it's obviously all the most adult anime. Is it's full of gratuitous violence and sexuality. Yeah. And it's um, it was a hard subject matter to, to kind of create. A poster for without doing just the floating head thing. Yeah. So I, I, I ended up watching the movie several times, and and there's there's that scene right at the end where he just loses his mind and starts hacking those yeah. ninjas to pieces, pieces, and they show that particular scene over and over and over again. And so I just kind of wanted to <laughs> encapsulate the fury of that scene, like, and, and mm -hmm. put it on paper. Um, so, uh, yeah, and I, that particular print I did, I think I did a, did a spot varnish on the blood. So it's got kind yeah. of a sheen to it. So it was just, I, I was trying to, I was trying to, uh, boil the movie down, I think too. And, and, and the iconic scene. Yeah. Um, rather than just a character stuff. Uh, did, did you, did you watch the, the live action Shinobi movie, which is basically the same story? Oh no! I, I think it's from that. 2010, a Japanese movie, obviously, and um, it's it's a really cool take on the Ninja uh, uh, Kuga Ninja Scroll series, and uh, the 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 characters like the 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 different like superhero abilities, you could say, they they come up really cool in the live action uh -huh. version. I really enjoyed that one. Yeah, I think. Um, it I think if I had another shot at doing that print, I, I would take it because I think that there were some missed opportunities to get into more of more of what the characters mm -hmm. are about. I think um, I just yeah at the time it's like you know there's ebbs and flows of kind of creativity and I at the time was trying to um, investigate ways to do more uh, scene based mm -hmm. pieces, so I wasn't trying to like I. I fall in and out of love with doing the floating. Yeah, head of course. Um, oh, so it's like it's obviously it's kind of the bread and butter of a lot of artists to do, you know, floating heads and uh, mixed, uh, interspersed with scenic elements or small uh, bits and pieces mm -hmm. of the movie. But um, I don't know. I just sometimes I want to I want to take a uh, like a simpler mm -hmm. approach and just try to encapsulate a very small part of a movie rather than. I, like I don't want the poster to be cliff notes for the yeah, movie yeah, yeah, yeah. necessarily. I want people to be drawn in by the poster and try to explore the movie on their own time and terms. Yeah. 
Um, so hopefully that's what it did. I think it, I, I think it draws people in with the colors. I think the colors came out really well. They popped. Um, and obviously, like, yeah, the red, red is always a great color. I love to use red in prints. So the red on the white, I think it's, it's very striking. Yeah, it, it definitely is. It looks really cool. And I really enjoyed this, uh, this poster. And um, the next one I wanted to talk about is the 24 by 36 documentary uh, piece you did. You're also part of the documentary. So I think there's a bigger story to that. Oh. <laughs> yeah, that was um, that was really interesting. I was just it started out with just kind of a um, uh, an email exchange and just, you know, we're looking to interview some artists and. Um, you know, I didn't know what was going to come out of it, but, um, the experience was, uh, was great. Um, uh, I, I, I just, you know, I, I felt kind of like, um, you know, you have imposter syndrome and I just felt like a little mm -hmm. out of place, but, you know, I was happy to be a part of it. Um, and then, uh, being asked to do a section of the, of the poster along with, you know, I think it was what, four other yeah. great artists. I mean, it's like, it's, it's hard to be. Um, so it's like, I felt like I needed to really up my game at that point. Um, but yeah, um, the, the interview process was very interesting. Yeah. Just like you and I talking now, it's, you know, it's kind of, it's always hard to kind of look internally and figure out what your process was. Um, especially going back as far as I go back. Like I, I think when I started this back when I was, you know, I guess I was 30 yeah. at the time. So, uh, I just feel like a completely different person. Um, what did you, did you go back at some point and look at what you said and like, do you, do you, would you say, Oh, I would say with something <laughs> totally different today. Oh yeah. I mean, it's obvious it's cringeworthy. I hate I, <laughs> <laughs> watching yourself on film. I, I imagine you probably watch yourself all the uh, time or have, at least with the editing. Process. Actually, this, I, I try to like, I just, just know where, like I, I, I note down the time when I need to, when I know, Oh, there's something I need to edit. So I basically go there and just edit the, the parts where I know something's really bad. So I don't have to look at myself for the whole time because I don't like it either. And it's like um, the, one of the first interviews I did was with Greg Ruth. And he uh, was, he was saying, uh, well, um, you, you could send it to me, but I'm not going to watch it because he doesn't want to watch himself. So it's like a, it's like a crazy thing. But I, I totally understand. It's a it's a weird feeling to see oneself and hear oneself uh, talking about something so yeah and uh understandably if you grow up something changes and I, yeah that's what that was the case for you as well i think <laughs> yeah yeah i um yeah i mean even it's i feel like the level of posters that i had um to even talk about at that time like artists talk a lot about you know how the last piece they did they think it's terrible it sucks and then they move on to the next one and this one is now the greatest one and then you know you move on from that one and everything you did before mm -hmm. is terrible um i i've tried, tried to embrace um the things that i've done initially like the very first series i did was just kind of music mm -hmm. icons and these were very simple um vector drawings that were i think two colors but it was basically a one color yeah. print um but that series People love that series, and they still ask me to do pieces yeah. for that series. But it's like what used to take me, you know, a week to figure out because my technique sucked, and I technically wasn't as good, obviously, as I as I feel like I am today. But like, it used to take me several days to do one of those pieces. Now it's like uh, I think I could do one in a couple <laughs> hours, and you know, it just feels like, it feels um, like I'm kind of cheating myself out of the process by not really challenging myself. So I, I cringe about going back to those old series, but I don't want to take the significance of them away from the people who mm -hmm. still love it. So yeah, I, it, it's tough. I, I think, um, especially since I, um, I tend to bounce around stylistically. So yeah. sometimes I'll come up with like a technique that I think works for a certain subject matter. And then uh, find out that um, I, you know, I didn't enjoy it, or it didn't work out like I had hoped, or you know, especially if a print doesn't resonate with people. Um, 
like uh, them. You know, I just I, I like to bounce around stylistically. Yeah. I, I try to have um, you know super clean vectors, and then I go super uh, brush heavy, and then I'll do originals and scan them and convert them into screen prints. It's just I, I think it keeps things fresh. But um, yeah, going back to the interview with um, Kevin for twenty four by thirty six, I just you know I was I was very much in a I think I was in a place where I had just done a solo show for Spoke with uh, a bunch of anime mm -hmm. stuff. Um, and that was a period where I was very much um, against doing my line work in Photoshop. Yeah. So I was doing a lot of line work specifically in Illustrator because um, I was just afraid of the shakiness that I was getting. I, I was still working on a I was working on a, a Wacom uh, Intuos, the, the ones that you put on the desk surface. Mm -hmm. And I just like, technique wise, I just feel like I completely sucked. So I was, <laughs> I, was, I was working in Illustrator to keep things very clean and then coloring them in Photoshop. And it was, it was a very um, time consuming process. Mm -hmm. And I think like nowadays when I go to like my Once Upon a Time in Hollywood print, I did all of that in Photoshop mm -hmm. and I just, found it to be way more, it's, it's a much more natural process. I'm, I enjoy the little nicks and scratches and bad edges. And, and, you know, I try to actually build all that in now. Like I'll use, I'll use a brush mm -hmm. that has, um, it's real dry. So it leaves a, a kind of a cracked line or I'll use, um, a dither brush to add, uh, missing pixels yeah. and then added pixels. And I think it just, for me, it was kind of a natural evolution to get to that point, but I had to develop, I had to develop the confidence in my own work to try to to then um, simplify it and make it more of a natural process. I was just at that time that I did <laughs> that interview. It was just very much about the perfection of the of each piece, and so yeah, it's like I. I love now that I've been able to kind of break it down and, and make it more of an enjoyable <laughs> experience to create these posters. Because, yeah, it's like, you know, you know, you get you get a subject matter and inspiration and you're like, I'm going to dedicate the next week or two to this project and I have to love it the entire time I'm doing yeah. it. So yeah, you have to be selective and you have to enjoy what you're doing. Um, so, yeah, I, it's it's funny that you picked that poster because, uh, <laughs> yeah, I it was a great experience, but yes, definitely cringeworthy. I, I do not go back and watch. <laughs> all good, all good. So um, speaking uh, of beginnings, uh, I was wondering, how did you start out? Like, did you do, because you mentioned earlier, you didn't do like a, uh, you didn't study screen printing in that kind of sense, but uh, how did you start out? How did you come in contact with the illustrating graphic design world? that just was you know I was the art kid and so in high school I, I ended up I took art all the time it's it's what I did but when I went to college I was kind of of the mind that um, you know I didn't want to be I, at the time people were like oh you're gonna you're gonna be a starving artist you know that if that's what you want to do you're gonna be a starving artist and I was like you know I do not want to be a starving artist <laughs> so when I went to college I I took a, a weird turn to towards um, digital arts. So I was doing a lot of interactive video mm -hmm. and then like web design, which was huge at the time, um, which, you know, web design has since crumbled to dust. Yeah. And it did several, it did basically the year after I graduated. It just <laughs> wasn't the same like thing anymore. So um, I was doing interactive design and trying to incorporate kind of my hand done style like my illustration skills I think is what set me apart as, as a graphic designer and a web designer mm -hmm. um, but it didn't afford me the same um, satisfaction that like a full-on illustration would so at the time I was just I think I was searching for something and what I found was um, I was uh, honestly it was uh, it was like the Shepherd Fairy and Obey Giant okay ones. I found them to be uh, I liked the style. It was graphic and iconic, and the colors popped, and it was a process that you could smell and touch, and and it was satisfying. And it also it rubbed, um, 
my interest in collecting because I'm just okay. I'm a rabid collector. So I am I'm a collector of art and and screen prints as well as a creator. But I started out as a collector, and so I I started collecting these posters, and I just got to a point where I was like, I think I could probably do this on my own. Like I just I need to find out how to do this. So I found um, a screen printer, um, and I just started working on my Adobe Illustrator skills and trying to build that up. And then I, you know, I, I got the screen printer lined up. I send them art, and they're like, "You have to color separate this." <laughs> like, there it is. What? There I, it I, is. Color separation. What is this process? And they were like, "Oh, you got to do this, this, and this." It's like, okay, well, this is a whole other challenge. So I basically. <laughs> worked my way up from knowing nothing to nowadays I really love talking shop especially with the guys who are doing the work like yeah, I work with screen printers that I can call on the phone and just talk about you know what did I do here which pixels are we going to lose you know what uh, what can I do better mm -hmm. next time and uh, learning from these experts who I, I would consider them to be just as much the artist um, as the guy who's putting the image on, on the paper. I mean, what they do is, is yeah, extraordinary. Yeah. I, I uh, have a couple of friends who want to get into separations and stuff. And uh, and uh, I just talked uh, yesterday, or the day before, um, I talked to Matt Griffin, who did the, the June, okay. uh, like he did uh, like the, the book cover and like the, like the front and end illustration for the book. And uh, we were talking about the separations because he thought this this can't be separated. His print, it's like it's like a very cool print. It came out in a bottleneck uh, two weeks ago, and it's going to be for because we are recording today where the new release episode comes out, and that's why I talked to him for it. And he said Matt Ferguson is like the the separation Jedi. I think he called him the Sep Jedi, and. Uh, basically since Matt Griffin thought yeah this can't be done and uh, he showed it to Matt and Matt was like oh yeah I'll have it done in like 15 minutes it's okay <laughs> something like that is like <laughs> totally crazy so it's like I always I, I, I can't even imagine I tried to with, uh, with another friend I tried to like he, we tried to talk about it or at least he, I asked him how, how it's done because he did, didn't know as well um, how the separation is done but I can't even imagine how crazy it is to separate it and like what to do actually sometimes you have like an idea but you're not good at it or whatever or you couldn't do it because you never did it but I don't have a clue how the separation thing works Yeah, I am. Um, I yeah, I did. I like I said, I learned it from the ground up. So I started with um, vector illustration, which um, I think, well, at least for me in my experience, it's an easier way to color separate because uh, the, everything is clearly delineated. Like the colors can be done on different layers and stacked. Mm -hmm. And you would think that the same thing would hold true for Photoshop, and in a way it does. But when you're dealing with pixels and uh you know ink overlays and you know how are these will these colors mix are they opaque enough to not mix or are they can i use transparency then to get a you know a tertiary color out of this one so i think um for me the evolution to moving to um kind of a modified it's a it's a modified cmyk process usually we um we include some custom colors mm -hmm. in there. Um, like the, mm -hmm. uh, the Westworld print that I just did, yeah. um, was, uh, it was a standard, um, custom. It was our, it was the uh, custom four color process that I've been using with, um, my printer. Um, but we also added, um, additional colors, um, just spot colors, uh, so that we would get more of a true, um, pigment out of it. Um, so it's really, um, For me, I just, I've worked my process now to the point where I think in color separation. Mm. So I always, I build from the bottom to the top and I start with the key line <laughs> and then I work from the bottom to back up to the key line. So, uh, yeah, it's been, I, I love the process of color separating. I, it's, I think it's the thing for me that separates, um, the screen print artist from, um, you know, just, a I don't want to say just a. Yeah. But, you know, poster artists who don't work in screen print, I, for me, the screen print process itself is very satisfying. Okay. And, but would you, like, I, we, we were like, I think we were way down. I had a couple of questions before, but I, we're into it now. <laughs> but um, would, would you, uh, do you consider other kind of print work? Like, 
for example, when you want to go like with even more colors and more details, maybe like do a G clay, fine art G clay print or something like that. Yeah. Um, or do, would you rather do a screen print all the time? I think, um, well, you know, it's going to sound, it's, it might sound cocky, <laughs> but it's like sometimes I'll look at, sometimes I'll look at a print that um, is done as a G clay and I, the quality of a G clay is amazing. And I've done many of G clay myself, but um, sometimes I'll look at a G clay and be like, you know, I, I could, I could color separate that into okay. a screen print. Um, and it's, so it's kind of a personal uh, challenge, I think for me, like I enjoy being able to do um, like what I did with uh, um, uh, kind of the Mandalorian trip, triptych that I sent you that is mm. that's a I think it's a five color it's a it's five colors and it's a screen print but I'm getting an infinite uh, palette out of out of those color yeah. combinations and it's just it's a process of um, you know the uh, the half tones but also uh, the, the, the ink themselves being transparent enough to create even more colors on top of that so it's the possibilities are are endless for screen printing once you understand the process itself. Mm. Um, so for me, it's been extremely rewarding to say, you know, I want to do a piece that has 50 colors in it, but I'm going to create it using five. Okay. And so I, I, I like that process. Um, I, it's just, I, it, it's one of, it's, I've, I've said it already, but it's, it's part of the magic of screen mm -hmm. print. Um, is that um, I think what we're doing now, what you're seeing now are guys who are pushing the limits of screen print um, as as we know it. I mean, I think there's a great uh, tradition in, in super iconic, very bold, um, limited color palettes. Um, obviously, screen print is built for that. But now uh, there, are, there are tons of artists out there who are doing photorealistic screen prints yeah. as well, using, yeah. you know, four color processes and five color and halftone processes, and I think we're we're really seeing a dramatic jump in in the the quality of screen print, um, the limits of what you can do with it, um, and I just I really enjoy it. Like I, I, I like I told you before, I'm the guy who loves to get within you know half an inch of the print surface <laughs> and really enjoy. It. I, I enjoy seeing the individual pixels, how they're interacting. Yeah. I try to figure out how the artist color separated the work um, to try to understand if they've, you know, did they use a uh, overlay of two inks to get this other color out of it? Are they, you know, so uh, I, I, yeah, I can appreciate a good, like, you know, this screen print is 14 colors. It's like, yeah, I get it. That's awesome. 14 colors. But could you have done it with five? Could you have done mm -hmm. it with six? So, uh, so what, what I was wondering always, um, when you do this kind of screen print, do, do you do like a like a cutout thing where you like do the colors over, or how how does it work? Because I was wondering, you know, I always see like the machine and how they put the color on, but I never seen like the details. Um, yeah, for me, um, I uh, because screen printing is done one color mm -hmm. at a time. You basically are working mm -hmm. with uh, you're working with black and white pixels essentially. So you know everything that's everything that's that's uh, I, I work um, I work a lot with masks so that I can understand um, uh, what's what's black is not shown and what's white mm -hmm. is shown. So mm -hmm. um, and then tinting the layers to the colors that I need. Um, but, uh, I, you know, I use with my most recent work that I do with the five color, uh, like halftone process, it's, it's halftones that are actually combined with dither so that it has kind of a dual, like it has a, a different look to it. So I can get a painterly or screen printy type of look mm. to it, but still I'll uh, be able to access a um, an unlimited color palette. So uh, it's just um, it's a combination of a lot of different techniques. Like when I did my first um, when I did the original trilogy um, for Star Wars, those uh, prints were that was my first time trying to do um, which, like a, a full which color which one process. are we talking about the the Boba Fett? Uh, 
episode four, five, okay. and six that I did. For okay, Star I think Wars. I didn't uh, didn't download that one, but yeah, I will I will try to put it in later. Okay, but that yeah, that was the first time that my um, I talked to my printer, and he was like, "Yeah, you can totally do an unlimited color palette." if we work together on finding the right combination of colors. And um, so I worked with that and I, I did a lot of um, photo manipulation in that one. Like I really wasn't, um, I, I wasn't at the point technique wise where I was um, kind of repainting mm -hmm. everything. Um, so I was doing a lot of photo manipulation to get basic um, kind of highlight, midtone, dark tone, um, out of things and then mixing the colors visually in mm -hmm. Photoshop. Um, mm -hmm. But what I do now, which is a little bit different, is I will do the painting um, in a similar way that like an oil paint, some oil painters will do kind of an underpainting that's a sepia mm -hmm. tone or, or a grayscale and then tint over top of that. So what I do with all my pieces is I do an, an, uh, the key lines and then I'll go back and do a grayscale version that's completely painted out, fully realized, but it's a grayscale version. And then uh, by um, picking out the, the different shapes, like you know somebody's shoulder pad, that, that'll be a shape. And then I'm able to pull that shape out and apply it to my light, mid, and dark mm. tones to get the different gradations of things. I know it doesn't make, it probably makes absolutely no I, sense. I think, but I think I, I think but, I can um, imagine how, how it looks like. Yeah, so like uh, the Mandalorian um, triptych print um, is a good example because that one, um, that that's like that exact process. I did I did a fully realized um, grayscale version of that piece, and then um, using those tonal values, I was able to then um, mix the colors that I needed out of the four mm -hmm. that I had, um, mix those colors to create all the different colors on that print. Um, so, uh, yeah, but it, this new process kind of affords me the ability to do a lot more mixing of techniques. So yeah. that piece, that piece has a lot of dither, a lot of halftone, some oversized halftone dots, um, which is kind of an, an interesting effect. I think it gives it kind of a comic book look, um, an old school type of, you know, the, the heavy dots that you can see. Um, but then I can also like, in the background of that print, um, there's a very smooth mm -hmm. gradient. So uh, the radial gradient that's right behind the Mando's head, um, that was you know just fully digital. So that one, uh, I I like where I, I'm really enjoying the process that I'm using now because I it, it affords me a lot of opportunities to mix and match different techniques um, and still deliver artwork to my printers that's technically sound. Yeah. Like it's I, I really. I take a lot of pride in, in the color separation process um, and giving them a file that they don't have to do a lot with. They can just take it. That's right very to nice print. of you to do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's just like, it's, it's just part of the challenge that I just, I really enjoy the technical yeah. side of the whole thing. Okay. Um, I was wondering, cause, cause we talked about university, which, to which university college did you, did you go to? And you, you sent a cool picture. I'm, I'm going to put it in there for all the world to see. Okay. Uh, what what do we see there? <laughs> that is me and my wife on our first date. Oh, um, I took her out to kind of a semi-formal oh. dance that was happening on campus. We were we both went to UMBC, it's yeah. University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Um, people may know them because they actually got into uh, the uh, the NCAA oh, okay. uh, tournament uh, last year. So uh, I think it was last year. I don't remember. Um, I didn't follow anyway, the tournament last year. so Yeah, but it was like a big deal because they're considered to be an extremely yeah. small school. However, my, uh, my wife went to a UMBC on a, uh, on a full-ride volleyball oh, okay. scholarship. So she was kind of like – she was the jock <laughs> and I was the nerdy artist. And we just like, uh, you know, met, fell in love, and, and it's, been, uh, it's been a long time. We, that was, I think that picture was in – was, was that Christmas? It looks like a mistletoe in the back there. Yeah, yeah, it was her oh, okay. apartment, and one of her mates had put like lights just strewn around <laughs> the, the uh, apartment uh, room. But yeah, I mean, it was long, long, long time ago. <laughs> um, but yeah, I was going to I was going to school to be a uh, an interactive motion designer. Okay. 
So it was just, you know, heavy into the, um, you know, at the time it was, I think it was Shockwave or uh, it was some dumb program that doesn't mm. even exist anymore. And like Flash, which really doesn't yeah. exist anymore. Oh, man, so those like, times. <laughs> I, yeah. I mean, we had to, uh, I, I kind of like, I had to teach myself a lot of, like I taught myself Photoshop. Eventually I taught myself Illustrator. So it's. Yeah. Um, good, good thing that you studied at a university, I, huh? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's funny. I like. I think that yeah. If if I could go back and talk to students at university, don't, I don't, would. Don't don't go. Just do your own thing, huh? <laughs> yeah. It's like I would try to explain to them more about the process of working with clients. Yeah. Because I really feel true. like that's the missed opportunity. Um, I, I think you go in, you come out of college with pie in the sky ideas about how great everything is going to be, and the reality is, is you're working with people who don't necessarily understand. Yeah. The process that you go through, um, they don't, they don't understand um, that you know being an artist is a real mm. job. Like it, it's hard, and there, there's a lot of rejection. There's a lot of people who don't necessarily know what they're talking about, telling you exactly what to do. So it's like, it, yeah, if I could go back and talk to students, I would, I would try to impart <laughs> some sort of yeah. know, techniques to deal with with people and client interaction. Um, but also I, I did go back to UMBC. They asked me to come back and speak to students mm -hmm. about being a professional artist. And I found that a lot of them hadn't even considered having a portfolio online. Wow. Wow. Like nobody, nobody had a website. Nobody had a portfolio. It's like, how are you going to sell yourself to I, a, an employer, a client? How I was, I was just asking, was it, was it 15 years ago when they asked you to come back in? I mean, because come on, <laughs> we're in times of social media. Like there's so many networks to do. You would think, yeah. I mean, you would totally think that, I think it was probably, I don't, my son wasn't that, it was probably like uh, six, seven mm -hmm. years ago. But like I was floored. It was like, um, yeah. you guys need to get a website like now, today. Get a website, put your work up, work on your branding, and reach out socially to people yeah. to sell. The, the marketing, the marketing aspect is like as an artist has to. If you, especially if you're freelancing, uh, it, it's a it's a big part of your job, basically. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, you have to be um, utterly shameless when it comes to self promotion. Mm -hmm. um, I think uh, a lot of young artists are like, well, you know, I don't want to toot my own horn, you know, because I, I'm not that great. I'm just drawing <laughs> pictures and I'm like, that is the wrong approach, period. You need to change your thoughts on, on self-promotion. You need to be confident in what you're doing and get out there and sell mm. your work to people because the art is very subjective. So you have to impart to everyone that yours is the right choice. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, that's like, it's another hard lesson about, getting into the professional art world is that it's not sunshine and lollipops and creating fantastic artwork. That's only part of it. <laughs> like the rest is marketing, fulfillment, um, social outreach, um, dealing with uh, customers. And yeah, I mean, it's, it it's a lot of, it's a lot of work. It, it can be extremely rewarding, yeah. but uh, let, let us elaborate yeah. that on, because I have like a tips for beginners section in the end. So let's elaborate. Yes, let's elaborate on that yes. a little bit. It's, it's all good. Don't worry. Don't worry. <laughs> it, this is a this is a conversation. We 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 can go all over the place, but uh, I try to rein us in a little bit. Um, since this is a since I do actually movie posters and review movies and TV shows, I was wondering what was the last movie, TV show, whatever you saw, and uh, what are your thoughts on it? Um. Okay, uh, the last show that we watched um, was we uh, took the time to rewatch the entire um, Clone Wars series. Yeah, good choice. Um, I think that I think that Dave Filoni is brilliant, mm -hmm. and that series um, elaborated on things that 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 the prequels sorely yeah, left exactly. out. And I think. I think after now watching the series again, like we watched it initially up until I think season five when my son was very little, mm -hmm. we watched the whole thing and it was fantastic. But you know, now um, my daughter, uh, we wanted her to watch it too since season seven came out and I didn't want her to miss out on all the previous 
um, storylines and mythology and, and everything that the entire series mm-hmm. elaborated on. Watching it again was was amazing. It was incredibly enlightening. And now I can go back to the prequels, which yeah. as a hardcore fanboy of Star Wars, I never hated the prequels. There were things yeah. about the prequels that I just could not watch. Like they were just scenes yeah, that cringy, were cringy, that cringy. Cringy. so cringeworthy. Um, but now that I understand kind of the backstory of the whole thing and how Clone Wars really draws that and, out. And, and like, I also think Anakin became just such a great character through Clone Wars. And yeah. like when you look at episode two, for example, when he's basically, I'm sad, I'm angry, I'm sad, you know, yeah. it gives him more of a spectrum and more of a balance as a character. And I think Clone Wars did such a great job to um, make this character great again, basically. <laughs> Yeah, it really, it really did. Um, and I, uh, there's, there's a, I think there's a three part um, episode, three, three part series, kind of in the middle of maybe season mm-hmm. three or four, where they end up on a planet talking to um, this uh, force yeah. user who has a son. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a that's that's a that's a great one. A yeah, person. Mortis. It's I on mean, Mortis, it's like, I think. Yes, Mortis. It is unbelievably uh, enlightening as far as yeah. what is the Force? It's, why are midichlorians even yeah. a thing? Just and like and then uh, uh, fast forwarding to the end of that series where the clones spoiler alert by the way they have <laughs> for all the people out there. <laughs> spoiler alert. Sorry, uh, but yeah, the whole like the background about Order Sixty Six oh, and oh how my that God. Came I mean, it's like. It's heartbreaking it is. It to is. watch, and I think that that series um, is so important for anyone to watch. Please watch it between episode. If you watch episode one, start watching it. If you've watched episode one and two, you have to watch it. Then watch episode three. Yeah, because it's like there's things that go on in season seven that talk about what's happening in episode three. Yeah. But it's the whole other half of the story. That exactly, totally missed. different perspective. It's it's great. <laughs> Yeah, I, I cannot talk did about you, how great that. I can't talk enough about Did you watch Rebels as well then, or not yet? We did. Yeah, I want to go back and watch Rebels now because that, you know, that's further um, elaborating on Ahsoka's mm-hmm. story and how, I mean, sh- spoiler alert, <laughs> but like her last, her last oh talk God, with oh Anakin. And I was like, oh my God. So at this point, she doesn't see him again. Until I, I was crying. Leaving. I was crying, actually. <laughs> Yes, I mean it's yeah, it's making my. I get yeah, it's making yeah. My, I I got yeah, goosebumps like, already <laughs> too. <laughs> but yeah, it's like uh, you know, Rebels has now got so much of uh, more important importance mm-hmm. to it to watch. So I, you know, I sound I sound like a horrible fanboy going on and but on. It's on about Star it's Wars, but it's the truth. It's the truth. Come on, I, I can take it. You know, I I got I got Boba Fett, the, the mythic Boba Fett there. I got a Tuscan Raider back there. I got I got Last <laughs> Jedi uh, Mark uh, yeah, Luke Skywalker back there, uh, and all, obviously yeah. over here the Obi Wan uh, mythos. So from side from sideshow, yeah. I mean, I mean, you talk to a fanboy <laughs> here as well. <laughs> Good. <laughs> yeah, it's a, I can go on and on, and on <laughs> but yeah, Dave Dave Filoni really he, he saved that that he saved the mm-hmm. prequels and then seven, eight, and nine. Basically, I I'd like to see them elaborate a little bit more on seven, eight, and nine because I I think there's mm-hmm. some content there that could be drawn out. Um, and so maybe that's the next step. I think Mando is sort of touching a little yeah. bit on like what's happening outside of the main scope of the story, but. I, like I'm excited, mm-hmm. I, and especially to see Ahsoka yeah. come back. and, and um, I mean the dark saber uh, at the end of the season one, okay. and uh, uh, Bo Katan coming back as Katie Sackhoff. It's it's going to be so great, and it's gonna I think it's gonna tie in. And since Dave Filoni is so involved, it's gonna be a live action Clone Wars probably. So this is yeah. this is this is so cool. I really enjoy it. Yes, yeah, I'm super excited for it. I can't yeah. wait for it to come back. Uh, are you excited <laughs> about the new stuff as well? Since we're touching on Star Wars here a little bit, was it High? Because the High Republic is it called High Republic? I think that place like two hundred years before Episode One. Oh my God! Is that they developed like, uh, that, and I think next month uh, there is going to be the 
the uh, um, the first novel coming out or uh, I think it was August okay. or uh, or July maybe I'm not sure but around there somewhere the f the first novel comes out and then I think every month there's got, I think three novels are gonna come out this year about this time and they already announced that they're gonna do a young adult uh, TV show with a with a female oh. force user in the middle and about this time 200 years before episode one. Oh, that's amazing! I um, I, I played the Old Republic games. Oh, okay. Um, Which one? Did, the the the, 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 the uh, Knights of the Old Republic or the Old Republic Online? Oh, okay. not the online one. I played yeah the other one, the single yeah, player it's... one, and I I really enjoyed just yeah, discovering it's... the mythology of the universe. It's, uh, it's one of that's like um, I think that's my favorite computer game I ever played. Yeah, um, the more the most recent Star Wars game, uh, what is it? The yeah, Fallen it, Order. Yeah, Jedi Fallen Order. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I thought I thought it was really good. It's definitely probably the technically the best Star yeah. Wars game that I've played. I I like the, I think the combat mm -hmm. is finally upgraded to feel more That's realistic true. as far as the universe is concerned. And, but but oh, the, there's sorry, a there's ahead. a big but. I have uh, I have an Oculus Quest, and I played Vader Immortal. I have to say that's the best Star Wars game in terms of immersiveness. And I I did the void the the the, the void the Star Wars void thing. I don't, they have it. I think they have it now at uh, like all the Disney places. But they used to have it in London. And I uh, back then my uh, my girlfriend gave me a present. Basically, hey, here is here's a, here's the flight and the entrance for this one. And we're gonna go next uh, next year. And we made already a date, like so. We we had definitely have a time slot there, and this was this was really great because you had like a, a I basically looked like a ghost like a Ghostbusters proton pack on on your back, and then yeah. you had a gun and you were like had the the goggles in and you walked through it, and it was it, it, the 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 first part of it plays on Mustafar, and you actually they had like like some warm like a like a, a um, like hair dryer kind of style. You could feel the lava basically. Like the the heat of the oh, lava, and you could smell the 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 sulfur or whatever it is, and it's like it was like crazy cool how they how they made that, and then Oculus came up with this Vader Mortal game. There's three episodes, and this if you have the chance, do it because it's incredible. They have like a like a um it's called a Jedi Dojo, uh, no lightsaber dojo. I think yeah, it's called lightsaber dojo, and you you can okay. basically have your lightsaber, and then they come like those little probe droids, you know, like with the with the little that they shoot the, the balls, yeah. you know, and they have some others as well. And then in the second episode, they, they included uh, force usage, so that's like really cool. I I, I can really uh, uh, um, like recommend this kind of game style. It's like very immersive and yeah, very cool. Yeah. Oculus, mm -hmm. okay, yeah, yeah. I'm I, I'm a I, yeah. Any kind of Star Wars content that comes out, I'm usually a sucker for so i you know i immediately jumped on fallen order and battlefront and and, and, and those games and uh, i just you know anything that gives me more mm. content and more reason to love these characters yeah. um is is you know i'm, I, I'm game yeah i I, I did like for a long time i did the old republic the online game for i think five or six years i played that and it's like i don't know it's like such such great thing i i, I was a bounty hunter uh my my role play name was uh, uh jazz coltrane and I always like I was hanging around in cantinas, or like all all on the different planets. And I I always played on a role play server, but I all, I also did a lot of PvP. And I was like I, I used to be like up there in the, the rankings, and then I was like looking for trouble with RP players, and like my character was like really rude, and it was like hitting on hitting on people, and uh, and like say hey what's up. <laughs> And like talking trash, and <laughs> and like <laughs> and then we had like a role play fight in the end, so that was like really really funny stuff. Like, <laughs> that's awesome. I yeah, I uh, th there's there's so much there's so much that they could get into. Um, I I just like I, yeah, I'm really excited. I'm glad that I was able to share that experience with yeah, my children. Um, I think bringing uh like episode one, two, and three was predated. Mm -hmm. um, my son. Um, but you know, when he got to a certain, when he mm -hmm. was like five or six and we started with episode four and where it did four, five, six, and then we went That's back good and, parenting. Did, you know, one, two, three. <laughs> and then when they told me, you know, we're doing an episode seven, eight and nine, I was like, Holy crap, this is great. So it's like every time I get to expose my kids to something that I love mm -hmm. so much as a child, 
um, and they just keep pushing more content, I'm like, how, bring it. Um, so my kids love it. We'll, we'll how do, how it did up. your kids like uh, Baby Yoda? Oh, <laughs> they uh, they love Baby Yoda. I mean, it's like what's not what's not yeah. to love. I I'm, I love that it's still they're still injecting some mystery yeah. into it. So there's really like, you don't know what the story is. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of uh, speculation yeah. about how how is it going to progress. And I like yeah. I just I love um, series where they don't um, necessarily mm -hmm. explain it, and you can kind of grow with yeah. the characters through the story. I think it's like, it's, it's masterful it storytelling. Is, it is. It's really good. And uh, uh, I, I'm such a nerdy fan. I, I ordered from Sideshow the life-size figure for Baby Yoda. Oh, <laughs> that's it. Has uh, been, yeah. No, I think I ordered it in like January or February or something like that. And I think it's going to come out at the end of the year, maybe in time mm -hmm. for season two, but I don't think so. I think it's going to be a little bit later because of like the production thing and COVID stuff going on. But yeah. Right. Yeah. I am. Um, my last purchase was that I got my wife the um, the uh, limited edition Ahsoka oh. Tano Minnie Mouse, mm -hmm. purse, um, which like sold out instantly from yeah. Disney. Um, we we spent all day online in some sort yeah. of queue waiting to get those ears. And it was like, you know, it's like you think I, I just spent, you know, so much money on these ears. <laughs> but um, when when you go to the park and you've got these things that nobody else has, yep. like it's really like a special experience. <laughs> my, uh, yeah, my son has the old um, R2D ears before. Yeah. It's the ones where uh, the ears are made of a certain, I think it's an, it's like a series one. Mm -hmm. So every time, every time we go, people are like, where did you get that version of those ears? And we're like, <laughs> we got it years ago. Collector's like items. Ago. Yeah. It's uh, it's crazy, but yeah, it's like, um, like I mentioned, I'm like I'm a huge collector. I'm a sucker mm -hmm. for yeah. I know the feelings. <laughs> yeah, I've got like um, I collected all of the Star Wars figures from Episode One through mm -hmm. Three. The so the, the like, Force, uh, the Legend of the Force one, the 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 the, 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 the smaller ones. Yeah, the um, yeah, the little guys that um, yeah. What was this? What was the series called? It's, now, it's something like, Legend of the Force or something like that. Yeah, I spent too much time and too much money on all that crap. <laughs> <laughs> I've got like 600 figures in star cases. Oh, I mean, yes. I know that's not a lot, but, you know, yeah, for me. It's, it still, was, it's still a lot, man. It's still a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, let's let's get back to the movies. Uh, uh, what, what's your <laughs> what's your favorite movie? Um, uh, no, I'm sorry. What, what's, a, what's, a, what's a movie you're looking forward to coming out soon? Oh, um, uh, definitely um, Pixar uh, Soul. Yeah, uh, good choice. I, yeah, I love um, Pixar. Um, I've been an enormous fan of theirs since, mm. you know, Toy Story came out in, what was yeah. it, 95, 96? Yeah, some, somewhere around there. Uh, yeah, it was a long time ago. I actually, um, when that movie came out, um, I got the Buzz Lightyear, um, like the full-size, real Buzz Lightyear. Yeah. Um, and uh, I, when my, when we had our son, I, I gave him that toy, and what I realized was is that toy <laughs> was, that toy was 15 years old when I gave it to him. I mean now it's oh, even it, old. It's like a 20 year old toy. I was like, I, for me, it's like Pixar is so timeless. Yeah, and their movies are so rewatchable that um, it's like it never ever gets old. Even the ones where the the people look like dolls because they can't render flesh correctly and yeah you know, just like oh it's getting to that point where it's not attractive <laughs> anymore but uh, the storytelling is so good yeah um that uh, yeah yeah it's just I, i'm really looking forward to i think pixar just nails the sentimental it they do they of, do it's like they, they they put like had so many different ways to uh, show or give some something some emotions and feelings like from yeah. toys over like feelings that are feelings. I mean, there's been so much going on and yeah, and I'm really looking forward for soul and it, it wouldn't surprise me. I think the trailer was that good that it maybe has like a best picture nominee in it or oh. at some point. I mean, Toy Story was nominated at some point for a best picture. I think that the first one or was the mm -hmm. first or third one. And I think soul could do that too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. The, to have movies that are, are completely animated be um, nominated for Oscars now, it just shows you how far 
the industry has come. Exactly. Um, I mean, Toy, Toy Story 1, I mean, you look at that, and I think, what did that, that came out, like, was it, it was after Jurassic Park came out. Yeah, I think. Which if, Jurassic Park kind of redefined what it was to use CGI mm -hmm. kind of in movies. Yeah, like, people were like, I believe it now. Yeah, Jurassic um, Park so, was 93 and Toy Story was 95. Okay, so it's like you can see, you know, uh, how far that industry has come. Mm -hmm. Like now it's like to put um, CGI into a movie, to actually to not have CGI in a movie is a huge deal. Um, to have like um, what they did in uh, episode seven with like, um, you know, practical effects and going back to puppetry and mm -hmm. masks and things like that. I mean, I think it shows you how, like that that industry has gone full circle, and now we're coming back to kind of more of an artistic approach to movie making with utilizing different techniques. Yeah. And um, but yeah, Pixar just oh my god! I, my favorite Pixar. Do we want to get into? Sure, go my, ahead, go ahead, go ahead. My favorite Pixar film is is okay. It's <laughs> when when my wife was. When my wife was pregnant, um, we were on vacation and we went to a little movie house and we watched uh, Ratatouille. Mm -hmm. Now, the, the, the final scene in Ratatouille where Ego takes the bite of the, um, takes the bite and imagines himself back in his mother's home yeah. is probably one of the best scenes in any movie I've ever seen. All right. I love that scene. But my favorite Pixar movie overall would have to be Wally. Yeah, yeah. Um, Let, let's let's circle back when we come to the poster. Okay. But uh, yeah, um, favorite movie and uh, not Pixar, but overall, which, which is that for you? Oh, um, man. Uh, my favorite movie. I I don't know what. What did, did did we talk about it previously? Yeah, we like, did, and I I just pulled it up for you. So <laughs> it was oh, oh, Temple yeah. of Doom with the Drew I'm Struze completely, poster. Yeah, I'm completely blanking. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, um, I uh, yeah, I love um, I love that I love that series, the Indiana Jones movies. I think uh, work great as a as a. It's not really a trilogy because they threw in that mm. one at the end. Um, but yeah, so, yeah, so, like, so it's a trilogy because nobody counts that one. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Temple of Doom, I think, is um, it's one of those um, like perfect movies that it's, it's a small the scope of the story is small enough mm -hmm. that you, you understand it. It's very easy to follow from start to finish. It's got a very good flow where you really don't have there aren't a whole lot of um, cuts where you're. Um, where it feels like you're moving from one location to the next without there being some continuity. So mm -hmm. it's, I love the scope and I love how it's got that classic, like Hollywood jump scare and, you know, gross out scene. And, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's got the, it's got the spike trap. And it's, that, it, like, had this, it has this super adventure feel to a movie that, that I really enjoy. Yeah. And they don't, I think they didn't, they don't make that kind of movies anymore with, with this adventure, oh. fun, feel good type of stuff that is not too scary, but has some elements in it. But I think they don't make that anymore. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I feel like um, that, yeah, that movie genre in particular is, it's, It's super fun, so yeah. I don't know why they. I'm sad about it as well. Yeah, movies like that. I just, I think maybe maybe audiences are coming to movies with certain expectations, and like when you have, when you have those iconic scenes, like when, you know, I, I'm thinking about um, specifically for Temple of Doom, like mm -hmm. when the door is coming down yeah. and he reaches under it to grab his hat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I like. I love that part, mm -hmm. but you might get like a more modern audience that's like, oh my God, that's so like dumb. And, and, that's so uh, 1980s. And, yeah. <laughs> but it's like, I, my kids in particular have very much latched on to that, um, that uh, time yeah. period. Like, good, they good, good. Kind of the hokiness. Did, of, did you show uh, Goonies yet? We did watch okay. Goonies. Um, my kids didn't quite get it yet okay, i think okay. they have to do a rewatch mm -hmm. of it um yeah they did they love all the indiana joneses they love um the star wars movies um let's see we haven't what else have we 
we've gotten into like um, since my son is a, a baseball player, we watched like Sandlot was another one, mm -hmm. and I have that print as well, um, which is just a great yeah. print. But um, yeah, it's um, yeah, but uh, Temple of Doom in particular, I just like yeah, I really feel like it's it's almost like a um, a uh, like I want to compare it to like um, a Samurai Jack yeah. or something, where it's kind of like it's a <laughs> single episode of a series, mm -hmm. and so you feel very satisfied with the way that it starts and mm -hmm. ends, and it's very it's like wrapped up and done, and everyone goes hooray, we saved the <laughs> yeah. day, and it's just it's great for that aspect. Okay, yeah, and since the the original poster is by Drew Struzan, is there anything you do not like about the poster? <laughs> oh, that guy, he doesn't know what he's doing. Um, that crazy. No, he's crazy. <laughs> obviously, he is, you know, considered to be one of, if not the master mm -hmm. of poster art. And we all owe him a great debt as far as uh, even putting the idea of a movie yeah. poster kind of. I, I mean, there's obviously guys who predate him, and so movie posters have always been this big thing. But um, for modern day posters, where you know a lot of people go, ugh, the movie poster is just floating heads. They all have the same color palette. Um, he has been steadfast in mm -hmm. in um, defining what the art of the movie poster is, not just the production of a poster to advertise a movie. Like he makes a work of yeah. art and. His portraiture is second to none. It's always spot on. Um, Composition-wise, it's it's beautiful. It's laid out in a way where you can see the flow of the story. Mm -hmm. uh, the combination of um, usually he'll put things around the frame or small objects that kind of interact with. So you get this like flavor yeah. of what to expect in the movie, but you're not given any kind of spoiler. Um, but there is... He is. He's hinting at things that are coming mm -hmm. in the movie. Yeah, I think that that'll. I, I always think that this uh, what for me was like the alternative alternative movie poster scene that made it so interesting was um, that I when I have a poster because most of the time you get those posters after you watch the film and not before and yeah. they pick d certain scenes that are maybe not spoilery but they they have a certain sentiment to it and uh, i think uh, drew struzan also puts that into the kind of uh, idea of the those movie posters and i really really do enjoy the way they do that like that and um that's why also i the, the Indiana jones temple of doom one is really great and uh You did also another one for that, and um, I'm just gonna pull that up real quick. How how do you feel uh, about that one? Um, I I tried to to be inspired by Struzan, but not um, a derivative mm -hmm. of it. So uh, I I I like to think that my strength is in portraiture. So it's very heavy on um, representation of the characters. Mm. Um, I was trying to show uh, just the colorfulness of, of the movie, um, the drama with like, you know, the flaming heart and yeah. um, a kind of, it, it's very symmetrical in the way that it's laid out. So I've got kind of like good and bad on both sides and mm -hmm. there's kind of hints, small objects. Yeah, it's, and then the, it's, it's very Star Wars-y, I would say, because like the Star Wars posters are like that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah, I think um, I've had a couple of art buddies say that you know the uh, the tri the magic triangle yeah. um, is is very much like I it's very forward in a lot of the work that I do. I enjoy symmetry mm -hmm. um, when I when I can do it. I, I think that um, it I think it makes it makes that particular print very solid in the way that it's laid out mm -hmm. because of its symmetry. So it doesn't have like. Like I would say, like some of the more recent posters I did, um, like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood has kind of a flow, yeah. like it has like an S curve that goes through. Um, the the Indiana Jones posters I did are very solid in their representation. And was that the, the print was obviously licensed? I would say was it or yeah. <laughs> no, it was a commission. Was oh, a private commission. commission. Okay, okay. Because I was wondering about the likeness of Harrison Ford. I mean, that's always like a topic that is really. Yeah, I mean that 
and it's funny you mentioned him in, in particular. Harrison Ford is one of those guys that, like, I would describe him as ugly mm -hmm. handsome. So, like, you look at him at certain angles, and you're like, man, that guy's good looking. But then you look <laughs> at him in others, and you're like, ah, who's that? Shield my eye. <laughs> so he he has a very asymmetrical face, and I've had the pleasure of drawing him many times uh, probably like a dozen yeah. at this point and it's always a challenge to get his likeness <laughs> right um because of the asymmetrical nature of his face <laughs> um yeah i mean it's it's definitely it's a challenge um it's one that portraiture is is fun um to do um but mm. when you do it wrong mm. um you get a lot of reaction from people. yeah I think people people have images that are very clear about um, celebrity in particular mm -hmm. in their heads, and when you put that down on paper, if it's not exactly how they saw it, um, you know yep. about it. Like they will tell you, yeah, they're like, oh my god, the neck's too long on that guy, or oh, is, 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 is it is that is that from the recent one? Because some people said that uh, yeah, about Brad did. Pitt, huh? People said that. I, like I loved that, you know. I, I felt compelled to send the proof that it was it was spot on, like the measurements yeah. were exact, and uh, it's just it's one of the most, like it's definitely a lesson learned for me. So um, you know, next time I do a piece, let me be more cognizant of you know that particular um, thing. I mean, I think it was the trick of the eye because his head is behind a letter that's I think it's it's right behind an H, which is very vertical in its nature yeah. so i think that the way that people's eye follows that line compared to the neckline like accentuated the fact that it was brad pitt's got a really long neck <laughs> like that's just that's that's, that's what it is yeah, yeah. That's how it works. And so i was like yeah that's that's how it works but you know because of the trick that was going on with the the parallels i think um it, it just over accentuated yeah. it so it's like when when I do a piece like um, the Temple of Doom piece or or another one that's heavy on portraiture, mm -hmm. I really have to be very intense about um, making sure that I'm getting the most representative um, uh, um, like source material possible. Yeah. Like I really don't. Uh, you have to get people at certain angles. Like for some people, profiles work way better than straight on. Yeah. And I would say that more so about probably um, female uh, actors tend to, you have to be very exacting about how you position their face and make sure that their their nose in particular works from like, if it doesn't work from a straight on, you have to turn it sideways to make it representative. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, uh, yeah, portraiture is, it's it's hard. Um, it's, a, it's a hard way to work, I think, with posters um just because it does open you up to a lot of judgment um, um but i think you know I, i've been pretty happy with the portraiture that i have done um and yeah i when i do a poster that doesn't have portraiture i find that people's reaction to it is not as good i think people like uh the the representation of actual people <laughs> i think it yeah It makes for a warmer poster, I think, and, and a more interactive uh, poster for people. So, uh, yeah. So yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I thought you, I thought you were gonna say something some more. So <laughs> that's why I didn't say anything. No, it's like I can go, I can go on. And yeah, on yeah, and on I figured. The, you know, <laughs> I, I, I like to listen. I, I think the, the people also like to listen. I mean, that's 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 what they're here for: listening to the artist talk about his art. <clears throat> But okay, the next thing uh, I wanted to yeah, I I had um, I had posts where I spent. Um, I'm so, I'm sorry, you're a little choppy. Hold up, wait, wait. Oh yeah, you're you're kind of going out, so I'm gonna let you settle down for a little bit. Yeah, hold up, we're gonna wait for a second. I I don't know if it's is it at your end the connection, maybe. Um, it might be my, uh, my kids have to do, uh, homeschooling, um, oh, okay. still. So there's a lot of streaming going on. Right ah, now. okay. That, that explains a lot because, because, because like, you know, I've, I've been balancing the whole time. Like sometimes, uh, because the, the, the resolution on the camera 
because of the stream goes smaller and I have to adjust like the resolution within the stream, oh. um, the, 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 the live uh, editing, you know, and it's like sometimes you're sometimes your head just automatically pops like like uh, becomes like super small and I have to like adjust and it's like, oh, switch scene, switch scene. <laughs> So I'm like, I'm like struggling here. That's, that's why sometimes I can't pay attention because I'm doing like the editing and then I hope, oh yeah, keep talking. That's good. <laughs> wow. That's, that's amazing. Kudos to you. Thank you. I, thank you. Uh, I, I do a little bit of video editing for, um, uh, sometimes and I just, I find it to be so, um, tedious. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, moving on then. Uh, yeah, yeah, we did that. Okay. I'm coming to the, the, the three movie posters now and I'm going to do like a little little uh, rollover. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So uh, since we talked about a lot of posters already, I was wondering what other artists you really enjoy when it comes to movie posters. Okay. I would... Um, I, one of the, the guys that I collect... Um, pretty much all the time um, would be uh, Anson. Yeah, Martin so Anson. So I have, I have quite a few of his posters around. I think his superhero work is great, but my personal favorite poster that I have hanging up is his Ghost of mm -hmm. Michelle print. Um, I think that... Uh, I like his Dracula of, a lot. His Dracula is very cool. Yeah, yeah. I think that um, like his early work is fantastic. I think that... Um, some of the stuff that he's done, um, like the larger, uh, movie posters and things, um, mm -hmm. I, 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 I like I, his strength is in, uh, the composition and the way that, um, he decides, um, with what the typography is going to be and how it's going to interact with the piece. Yeah. So his more interesting pieces are when he's kind of allowed to go off brand mm -hmm. and kind of redefine how the title works and how it interacts with the piece and the way that the title treatment works in the ghost and the shell print is, uh, is masterful. It's like done in a circular fashion. It's with, with a custom, I believe it's a custom font treatment. Um, but by exploring the way that it's in kind of circles, you, you discover the upside down, um, the other uh, female robot character is mm -hmm. like upside down, like underneath. And it's just the way that he dictates the flow of the piece with the typography, I think is, is fantastic. And that piece, uh, the colors are, are super poppy. Um, the subject matter, um, I like his treatment of the subject matter because uh, I, my own experience doing anime is often that um, if you don't stick to the character models, people don't, um, uh, they don't, um, react mm -hmm. to it in a very positive way. So you feel like you're almost, um, tracing in a way because the characters have to look like they do in the series. And I think that what Anson did with the ghost and the shell print was kind of use the character model as they are recognizable, but kind of redefined it a little bit in his own mm -hmm. style. Um, so, uh, yeah, that piece, I, I love that. Piece. Yeah. You, you have it up. Uh, I, I'm going to take it a little bit ahead because you also have the, uh, the, the print. You, you gave me a photo from, from your home where you can see the print. Uh, so yeah. I, I pulled that up real quick for everybody to see as well. And, and I saw there's already another Anson in there and I pulled up the black Panther one, The black Panther one I actually have in my flat file behind me. So this is, this is what, this is the one also in there. It's a, it's a really, really great piece yeah. by him. Wonder Woman's in there too, um, uh, right next to the Black Panther. Um, the Wonder Woman, I, I think it's great. I, it's not my personal favorite yeah. of his. Um, I, uh, but uh, the colors are just amazing, and and the the technique is flawless. Um, when you look at it up close, I mean, it's just, it's absolutely flawless in in the the execution of it. All right. Um, the Tyler Stout. So, um, I've been a, I've been a big fan of Tyler for, for a while. Um, I have his, uh, one of the photos that I sent you has his, um, his polar bear. Uh, um, I think it's polar bear two or uh, I forget what it's. I'm, I'm looking for it. Let me see. I have to go. It's, uh, oh, there it's it is. Got I, the, I found it. I found it. Yeah. yeah. 
So it's got the Horky and then the two yeah. Tyler steps, and then there's a Nan Lawson there, which I really love, um, and then my own uh, Amy Winehouse, um, and then a woodcut, which I'm, I'm blanking on the artist. Which is that, the woodcut? Uh, the Liz Taylor that's right above my Amy okay. Winehouse. Okay, okay, yeah. Um, that is a woodcut that's been painted and then reassembled. Um, and then uh, and then there the other are, are we going through the the pictures we, from, we can do that we can we can we can pick that ahead because it also includes I mean the question if if you're collecting and uh, yes we can tell you are collecting <laughs> <laughs> yeah um, I, I have uh, I think in the uh, the picture that I sent you the home uh, the seventh picture the number seven one that has my ping pong table in there yeah got it got it it's up. uh the ping, the ping pong table goes in the tips and tricks that we'll talk about later yeah uh, but yeah in that photo i've got two gabs which i'm a big fan of his mm -hmm. i think his work is second to none when it comes to yeah. detail and the micro detail there's the john wick behind me i was i was yeah. lucky I, I just told the story yesterday also to uh scott c because i was talking to him and um he uh I, i told him that uh, bottleneck was super nice to me since uh, yeah since i wanted to know your opinion as well on galleries but they were so nice to me they uh after the show and the the, the screening was already over and i think they had some leftovers and they were so nice they gave me the print because i just showed up like, oh. it was my first visit it's like to uh to the gallery and uh been like i think my third time in new york or so and uh yeah just showed up and uh It's 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 weird. Like since you think it's a gallery and you would like it would be like a museum, but it's not. But it's very yeah. cool actually to see those guys and I had a chance to talk to them and they were all like super friendly and then they just gave me this little surprise and it's like one of my, you know, stories to say, yeah, those guys are really awesome and uh, I love what they do. Yeah, he's um yeah, Gabs is one of those um talents where um like I love that he's doing this portrait series. Mm -hmm. Um Because it really shows off the fact that he's doing all of this stuff by hand. Yeah. Um, so the aesthetic that comes, tra that gets translated to his screen prints is coming from his ability to draw with pencils on paper. Mm -hmm. um, and just the level of detail he's getting um, is just phenomenal. Yeah. Um, so these two Gab's pieces that I have uh, on the wall, um, just like, Fantastic, but this is my like wall of Star Wars stuff. So you can see that <laughs> yeah. the Tyler Stout uh, triptych or uh, trilogy yeah. there. Um, those did you, I actually did you get them I, from the release or did you buy them like aftermarket? <laughs> I drew, I I completely missed it because at that point you know I was it was yeah. the time of F5 and you know refresh 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 yeah. and then print would be gone. So <laughs> oh, I man. totally missed it. I wanted it so bad. Um, so I reached out to him and he was like. If you enter the lottery I'm having, there's a good chance you might win. And then I, so I did, and he was very gracious, very gracious. And Tyler, calling I'm calling Tyler out because. No, do not, do not go to. <laughs> But I, it's like, I also have his lost print. Yeah. Um, and that was a similar situation. I missed the drop on that from uh -huh. uh, Gallery 1988, yeah. that drop. And I completely blew it. Um, <laughs> I, I forgot that. Uh, The clue was that it was going to drop at a particular uh, time. And yeah. The time was 108 because of that number sequence. Yeah. yeah, yeah And yeah, I yeah. completely blanked on the fact that it would be 108 Pacific time. So oh. I waited 108 a.m. Eastern time. Oh. And it didn't show up. So I went to bed and then I got up and it was gone. Oh, man. So, I'm sorry. Yeah. So I reached out to Tyler on that one, too. And he was nice enough to send me the print. And he also numbered it with my initials oh so man JB. yeah so it's i i'm assuming it's an ap copy but it has my initials on it and it's like I, it's one of those prints that i will leave framed and on the wall forever okay i think we have to stop here joshua i, I gotta go <laughs> <laughs> no but uh yeah that, that's great i i have to call tyler out because i uh sent him a message and we wanted to do an interview as well this the same kind of style And we almost had the date. I was asking him, hey, next week, is it possible? And then Tyler didn't get back to me. So Tyler, please, oh, no. please. <laughs> yeah, he's, um, I, a lot of these artists I, I find like, I, the ones who are forthcoming about sharing technique and, yeah. and talking about their work, I, I really appreciate that. I just, 
you know, the spirit, there's a spirit of competitiveness, which I get, but the artists that have nothing to hide and aren't um, afraid of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you can't do what they do, even yeah. if they explained it from step one to sure. step 100, you could not do what they do. Of course not. And yeah. so, so like Gabs, for instance, I am, um, you know, I, I called Gabs and, well, I asked him first, I was like, what brushes are you using? Yeah. Cause I cannot for the life of me, figure this technique out. Yeah. And he was like, why don't you Skype me? And we'll figure this out. So I Skyped him and he was like, here's what I do. Here's what it looks like before. Here's what it's after. Use these brushes. Mm -hmm. And he sent me the brushes. And I was like, this is a guy who's extremely respected in this industry. Mm -hmm. And like, I respect him. I collect his work. Mm -hmm. He seems to be completely untouchable. And yet he's just such a real person and he's so kind yeah and so and he uh yeah he lives not far away from me he's like i think it's just uh, uh 500 kilometers so like a maybe yeah. like a five hour drive so not that far away <laughs> so that that's a cool thing and uh, i think you just froze let's wait a sec oh you're back <laughs> no i'm back you started to get a little glitch yeah but yeah um yeah he's uh i i think he's he's a long way from me so when i called him i think it was in the evening yeah for him but for me like the morning yeah, it's, yeah, it was same weird. same situation yeah, same situation totally here. <laughs> to it. yeah yeah it was uh it it was awesome so yeah whenever he puts stuff out i you know i i i love to get it when i can mm -hmm. um it's hard to get this stuff nowadays but yeah uh yeah um i i reached out to him about a, the bruce lee yeah mm -hmm. um on the Yellow stock, um, Bruce mm -hmm. Lee, um, Return of the Dragon, I think is what it is, yeah, right? I think so. Yeah, Return, mm -hmm. and uh, with the uh, the Chinese um, characters on the bottom, mm -hmm. uh, and he he sent me one of the APs before he dropped it publicly, and he was kind enough to write a Bruce Lee quote on the bottom of it, or I gave it to my son. <sighs> um, but it's the perks of being an artist. Josh, you could you please stop? You're making me very jealous. <laughs> I feel like such a name dropper. It's awful. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that, that that's how you get them. So they're gonna they're gonna pop up here, and the, the, everybody's gonna hear how nice they are. And yeah, oh Josh, here yeah, that's your, that's the print for you. Thanks for mentioning me. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, I hope they don't. Come <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, how how do you like his brother though? I love his brother as well. Yeah, Krabs. Um, I don't. He's he's crazy. Yeah, crazy. I don't have any of his work. It, it's like it's really, it's difficult to. To get most of the time yeah i know but yeah i know those two guys it's like how could so much so much talent come out of like uh, you know a brothers it's like unbelievable that they would yeah. they're both so super uh, are, are, so, are there any brothers any other brothers in the game i'm sure there are um but yeah i don't i don't know any offhand okay but it either, doesn't so. seem like it would be that odd but to have the two of them uh be in the same industry yeah. doing pieces that are um, you can clearly tell, you know, one one piece from from one one of the brothers' pieces from the other. But the way that they, the, it's very similar to how I like uh, Anson, mm -hmm. in that their pieces are dictated by the typography. Yeah. So they are, um, they're very very good at custom font treatment, um, placement of typography, mm -hmm. using the words themselves to kind of dictate the narrative of the piece. Mm -hmm. Is um, it's really. Um, unique i think about their pieces yeah. um so i have like a really deep appreciation for the technique that they're using and the process mm -hmm. um but yeah like tyler i have i have a lot of his older pieces i i started collecting him back when you could still buy his work yeah um and it wouldn't good, just good for you everything. good for you <laughs> Yeah, it was funny when I started collecting um, Obey um, mm. 12 years ago, uh, Shep's page, when I first went to it, mm. it had about, I think it probably had about 20 posters on there that you okay. could buy because he wasn't selling out all the time. Like you could buy really, like all of his stuff, really old stuff, and it was all there. <sighs> and then like six months later, people were like, who is this guy? And all of his <laughs> stuff sold out. Like, it's crazy. So it's like, the industry itself has changed so dramatically. Mm -hmm. I think, um, like, even when I started, um, you know, I could drop a print and sell it in, like, a minute. It would be gone. Yeah, yeah. And, it, like, those were the good old days. These were the days where um, the galleries were just starting to come into their own. Mm -hmm. um, there weren't that many artists out there. 
um, the, the content was, you know, we, it was very much, it was like kind of like the wild west. Like there yeah. wasn't this whole, uh, licensing concern quite as much. It was like, these were pop artists making pop culture pieces for the love of the content. Mm. Um, and I, I miss those days um, because, you know, I myself dabble quite a bit in what would be called fan art. I'm yes. just not um, into the licensing game so much. I I think that uh, doing that for me has been very fruitful. I've had uh, the people who, uh, you know, the IP owners will hit me up to do like real work. Mm -hmm. So uh, for me, you know, I would, it's been a very good thing for me to kind of push that, um, push that in envelope of, uh, you know, what is licensing? Is it necessary? Yeah. And can I have the confidence to put a piece out, um, that may get me some work from mm -hmm. like the real people, like pay homage and don't sweat the licensing so much. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I, obviously I, I I've had just a couple instances in the 12 years where I've had people reach out and they're like, you can't release that. Um, but, uh, comparative to, I think I pro over 12 years, I think I've probably done uh, four or 500, yeah. maybe even more pieces, you know, to have only two get red flagged, um, is, I mean, I, I don't sweat it at all. I, I just, mm. I have no fear. It's like if I, if I love something, I'm going to put it out there. Yeah. Um, you know, and people either react to it or they don't. I just, mm -hmm. I don't sweat the licensing. I have, I have had a, you know, I had a few uh, Star Wars pieces that were licensed by Lucas um, mm -hmm. and I've done some licensing work. And, you know, obviously I love when galleries reach out and they're like, we have a license for something and we want you to do a piece. Mm -hmm. I'm like, great, fantastic. But for myself, it's it's really more about the personal exploration and paying homage to the things that I love and my kids love. And, and you know, there's always going to be an audience for that. Yep. There's people out there who love the same things and they're not going to care if it has a copyright on the bottom of it or not. Exactly. Okay. Um, since we already seen a lot of your house and um, <laughs> some part of your workspace, I would say, um, can you walk us through how, how do you work in, in like, in terms of like physical area? How, how, how's it, how do you do your things? Uh -oh. Um, yeah, if you, um, let's see, I think the photos that I sent you, like yeah. eight and nine. Eight and are nine. Okay, I pulled, up, like, I pulled up eight first. Eight is my setup for when I go to cons, okay. which I can talk about when we get to tips, I think. Sure, okay. I'll we circle back to uh, that then. I'll, I'll pull up nine. Nine is like, um, it's a really crappy photo because I didn't want to get, um, the, the table's not very substantial. Is, is, so that, it's just, is that where you're sitting at right now? Is that, is that the way? Okay. Yeah sitting here now um i i bumped up from like i said i think previously i started with the um actually i started doing ink um just on paper mm -hmm. and then transferring it using tracing paper and then scanning mm -hmm. it and i found that the the resolution wasn't very tight the scaling was bad you know when you go from eight and a half by 11 up to 18 by 24 yeah. your your line weights get um a little unruly i think and that's That can be a good aesthetic for some. For me, it wasn't tight enough, so mm -hmm. I needed a better way to work. So I transitioned to the Wacom Intuos, and I used that one until I basically scratched the surface down to absolutely nothing. So that was a good workhorse for me for probably eight or nine years. I used that, mm -hmm. and I got really good at uh, the disconnect of having your hand over here and your eyes over oh, here okay. and trying to pay attention. But now I... I was lucky enough to uh, to bump up to the um, the Cintiq. So now I use the uh, 27 HD um, Cintiq, and I think it. I was nervous at first that it would change my process a little bit too much because I got very used to the disconnect yeah. of hand and eye. Um, but what this has afforded me is is a very tactile, you know, work experience. Mm -hmm. Like I'm like I drawing it right in front of me, right on the screen. And I think, um, you know, at, this one was, a, um, I don't think it was scratch and dent, but it was like one of the Wacoms that had been used at a uh, convention or something. So it was like pre-used, mm -hmm. pre -used, refurbished. So I, I think I got it for about half price um, from Wacom directly. Okay. 
Um, I would encourage anyone who has an interest in doing this to take the next step to get um, a, a, a tablet drawing system. Like Wacom is great. Uh, like I love them. Mm -hmm. But uh, um, yeah, I think it it gives you the ability to work as if you were um, working on on with pen and paper. Mm -hmm. okay. um, but creating things digitally, which is um, ultimately the um, the medium that you're going to give to your screen printer. So uh, for for me, it was it was just natural to yeah. work digitally and I, and. I was kind of shocked, like when Greg Roos uh, told me that he just uses he has a rudimentary Photoshop skills, and he just basically scans stuff and puts them in panels for his comics. But everything else, he always uses analog paper and pencil and, yeah. and graphite. Yeah, it's like crazy. Yeah, I mean, it's like kudos to the guys who uh, work that way. I am, um, I am um, just my own way of working is uh, I try to give myself a enough rules and a small enough scope that I can get the project done in the amount of time that I feel I can budget for it. Mm -hmm. Like I'm, I'm very much like um, because I you know I have two active children, um, a full time job, and 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 you know, my wife has a full-time job and we're just running around all the time. Um, I have X amount of time to work on the project. So for me, it, it's, it was all about streamlining my process. So mm -hmm. anything that was adding an extra step or, you know, having to scan a document, having to ink, having to pencil, mm -hmm. having to do this, that, and the other. I mean, I, with the Wacom, I'm able to do the pencils, the inking and the coloring all in one space. Um, and it transitions seamlessly to a product that my screen printer can use in the end yeah. for the production. So. Okay, hold on. Sorry, my, my somebody just called me. I guess. Because <laughs> my phone was vibrating like hell. <laughs> and I was gone for a sec. <laughs> okay. Um, could we pick it up from uh, you work and your? I mean, your wife works and everything. And yeah, um, yeah. Both of us have um, full-time careers, basically. So, what, what, what other? Uh, yeah, what, what is your other part of your career then? Um, I am a I am a graphic designer. Oh, okay. Uh, for it's, <laughs> it's actually for um, the federal government here. Um, I got a, a good desk job. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it definitely pays the bills. Interesting. And I afford a lot of time off. Uh, yeah, it's um. I did the whole ad agency thing for a while, um, and I found that the the drama and the backstabbing and <laughs> the, the highly competitive nature yeah. of it wasn't what I wanted. Mm -hmm. um, so I transitioned to uh, you know because of where we live in the Baltimore D.C. area, mm -hmm. we're like right you know we're right outside of D.C. So pretty much ninety percent of the people around us work for the federal government yeah. in some way. So when I found out that there were art careers in the government, it just seemed like kind of a natural mm -hmm. transition. So uh, that job is fantastic for paying the bills, and, and um, but as you can imagine, um, rewarding for somebody who considers themselves an artist, I would say no. It's not really a place to be rewarded for. Yeah, that's for artistic expression yeah that's really interesting i thought you, you did this as a full-time job i mean since you put so much art out uh over the years i thought there was a full-time career already there because like that's i i know people who put out less who have a full-time career like that <laughs> yeah it's just um it yeah i i i I've had years where I did so much work that I shocked myself. I think it was mm. 2012 where I basically didn't turn down any gallery okay. shows. I think I did three or four a month and I did so much work. Crazy. Um, nowadays I, I try to do, uh, I try to work with, I think fewer, I've worked with fewer galleries. Mm -hmm. I tend to do more stuff just for myself. Um, like the and then like the portrait series that I did for Flood Gallery yeah. of uh, musicians was a very singular in its focus and it, uh, the pieces were small and and I could work nimbly and quickly and, mm -hmm. and get those pieces out um, but still create some great stuff so I 
I've just kind of altered my scope as my children have gotten older mm -hmm. and we've gotten busier. I've just, yeah, changed the scope of what I want this side gig to be to kind of fit our lives. And, um, you know, it's like, what are what are we all going to be doing in pop culture when we all start hitting 50, you know? It's like I, I've got maybe another decade before <laughs> I'm the old man who's still doing this. But then you look at, you know, you look at the guys who've been doing this forever. Like your Chuck Sperry has been doing this for a yeah. long time. Or, or let's say this, this guy, Drew, Drew Struzan, you heard of him? Drew <laughs> Struzan. I mean, it's, I, I, would I would hope to have careers like mm -hmm. theirs where they just become timeless like icons of the industry yeah. and it doesn't matter that um maybe they're not um you know involved in the scene mm. as much but they're still able to create relevant art yeah. that picks the subject matters in a way that pays them you know the correct homage to uh to the fans mm -hmm. um because you, you know the audience is ultimately the most important thing like if they If your audience appreciates what you're doing and feels like you were invested in the subject matter, mm -hmm. then the piece really shines, I think, more so than yeah. if it's a movie you don't care about, if it's a subject you don't care about, it will show in the artwork. Okay, so. yeah. Um, speaking of audience, um, I was wondering, is, is there anything you can talk about what you're working on? Is there, or is that all NDA? I have I, I talk like, most of the time people say, uh, I wish I could talk about it, but I cannot, sadly. And then we have to switch the topic most of the time. <laughs> um, I do have, I have some stuff like, I will say that um, I'm gonna, I, I'm, I, I'm got some stuff in the works with uh, Spoke Art. Okay, cool. I'm working with them. Um, I would look for some more uh, Star Wars related things. It's kind of. Are they gonna be? Is it gonna be something part. golden? Yeah. <laughs> I would look for yeah the uh, the series that I that I did with mm -hmm. them on the gold stock was a uh, the gold foil stock was a transition from the um, uh, engravings that I was doing laser engravings for a okay. while, on different uh, materials. Mm -hmm. Um, which is where that kind of series of one color prints comes okay. from. Uh, the problem is laser engraving is incredibly expensive and difficult to ship. So, uh, like, I loved doing it, but I don't know if the life of that mm -hmm. project was sustainable for the long term. So hopefully people are happy with the transition to um, the foil stocks. But uh, what I'm looking to do is just to continue... Continue that series. Um, continue um, paying homage to you know all the great characters and yeah. the droids and and the different uh, you know clone helmets and and uniforms mm -hmm. and the, like I love the the small details of um, that universe. I think so. Look for stuff for that from that and um, also I mean like uh, I love doing um, Tarantino uh, with them so. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. We are looking to continue um, that series. Okay, cool. Um, I, I've done a lot of work with them. Uh, yeah, Wes Anderson and Tarantino, which uh, you know, two completely opposite <laughs> directors, mm -hmm. but uh, definitely uh, subject matters that I I care about, which is really when I'm looking for. But new projects, did, did, I, uh, speaking of you, like did, did you like Once Upon a Time in Hollywood? Uh, yeah, I I really enjoyed okay. it. Okay, I, I wasn't I wasn't a big fan. Yeah, a lot of people are not. A lot of people didn't like it. Um, I there were there were certain parts in the um, in the the dialogue that I just I really enjoyed. I'm I'm I, I'm just like I'm a sucker for um, like Brad Pitt movies. Mm -hmm. So I I really enjoyed his character. I thought it was extremely likable. Um, the the end of the movie was very very shocking. But not out of character for Tarantino. Yeah, I think that was the Tarantino part of the movie. Yeah, um, I just I, I thought it was fun. Like it really, it doesn't, it doesn't. From you know, admittedly, I'm I'm no movie critic. I'm yeah. like more so like, did the movie give me a good yep. time for two hours? And I go, yes, it did. So I um, I liked it. Um, I wouldn't say it's my favorite Tarantino film, yeah. but I didn't mm -hmm. I didn't hate it. Okay. Um, yeah, I wouldn't say I, I. I would never say hate because that's that's not definitely not the case. I was entertained. It was a little bit long, I have to say, but uh, all in all, it was an okay movie. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, so I would, yeah, I would some more stuff like that. And I, yeah, I'm, uh, the thing is, um, right now, a lot of the galleries I think are, um, because of the whole COVID thing, mm -hmm. um, galleries are, are kind of looking for content and are they, I, I have a feeling bottleneck is popping out like five, four prints every week. And basically my wallet is empty and I can't do anything yeah. about it. And there's new stuff coming every week. <laughs> yeah, I am. I struggle with um, with uh, you know how much is too much to put out. Yeah. Um, and I think uh, the audience can get saturated. I think with with too much um, stuff. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I'm. But maybe a good I, maybe a good thing is if you miss out on one like certain movie or whatever or some some area uh, you collect and. Uh, you pick up something else and then there's the possibility of trade and more people get maybe served. I mean, for example, I really enjoyed the lenticular they did uh, with uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey, which was really cool to look at. And uh, But it was like very expensive and I knew that the Matt Ferguson uh, 40th anniversary for Empire Strikes Back comes out, so I had to make a decision. <laughs> right. It, do you find that it's still... Um do you sit online and just refresh, refresh, refresh? Like, it is, is it as hard to get the prints? Um, credit to Bottleneck in this case again, since they um, d tend to do like bottle box, like email kind of blast. So you have like a certain pre-sale and they always do group pre-sales. So you have a good chance of getting it. I, I actually got both variants of this, of the, the, the English and the Japanese one uh, of the, the Empire Strikes Back one. Yeah. So, and a lot of people were looking for that and a lot of people said they didn't get it and I was like, I'm lucky enough right away, put it, put it in the basket and got it. Yeah, it's, it's, it always feels good when you um, go to, like I just bought the, um, I think the last print that I bought was uh, Shepard Ferry did a, just kind of a uh, tribute to mm -hmm. nursing, to nurses. Yeah, yeah. Um, he put out one, uh, I think it was the first one he did, not the second one I completely missed on. Yeah. But um, my experience with him and uh, and buying prints is like from, the last print I think I bought from him was probably seven or eight years ago. Mm -hmm. And it was me sitting online for like two hours, refreshing constantly, trying to get through the process. Mm -hmm. And this this time I just, I went straight to the site got it i was done in like two minutes yeah that's like, that's like, that's crap, that's how it is believe. that's how it is today i mean you you get the time the drop is going to be at this particular time go ahead and the good thing about bo bottleneck is that they actually go through basically i think they go through by hand like look for bots and they even had like i think that was uh, two weeks ago or so they had like there was an ebay seller who actually bought this thing and put it right away on ebay and advertised it that is that you can buy it and well, bottleneck went through and uh, basically canceled his order. So that's great. That's that was a really cool thing that they do that. And to compare to Mondo, who is I, I mean, I understand that, that this is a lot of work, but I mean, Mondo's being bigger, having also a good artist, they should consider doing that. I mean, uh, I think I remember the Killian Ang Galactus and uh, uh, Daniel Taylor Silver Surfer. They had a couple yeah. a couple months back. Um, great pieces, but they were right away sold out. No chance, bots and so on. And uh, there were like there were like five, six, seven pieces already. Like ten minutes later on eBay for five hundred, six hundred dollars, and it's like crazy. Yeah, um, yeah. The the similar. Uh, yeah, I've had so many of those experiences where you're like, you know, I if if I had just gotten it, I could have saved. 500 bucks on the on the cost of this print mm -hmm. it's like how much do i really want this print yeah. um is it going to hang in my house forever or am i just going to mm -hmm. put it into a flat file and i've i've gotten really selective just mm -hmm. uh, you know when i first started this um collecting i tried to you know i was a completist mm -hmm. so i tried to buy every single poster that came out and if i missed one it was the end of the world and it was just it was too much stress mm -hmm. and I was spending a lot of money and I found that uh, 90% of it was going. And so I've just gotten like very selective and yeah. I think, um, you know, I would rather trade with a real person mm -hmm. um, who has the print. I would like to, um, yeah, trading with a real person, calling the artist, um, supporting the artist mm -hmm. more mm -hmm. so, um, I think is, is really important. Yeah, 
that's that's that was like I, I sold my I had a D, DKNG infographic for Spider Man and I sold that to uh, um, what's his name Vitario Konza, I, I think that was his name. Um, so shout out to you. And so he got my DKNG Spider Man poster, and um, this like I, I told him, yeah, I've I don't uh, some, I, for, for some reason I have like a bad feeling about parting with it. So please please make sure it goes to a good home, basically. So yeah. you know this. It's like it's like a weird feeling, but if you if you buy from a page, you don't have that feeling, and interacting with the, with the actual person is really a, a nice thing to do. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, I wanted to look into the future a little bit. Um, I'm gonna skip all like uh, the the work in progress stuff right now because I think we touched a lot on that, and uh, I think we could go on for another two hours if we do that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't want to I don't want to like the viewers to go uh, like crazy because like you, you know how it is viewers tend to watch only 15 minutes of a certain thing and uh, let's not overextend here um, but I want to yeah. look at the future as I said um, is there any IP or some idea you want to work on is there uh, like like an old or new movie franchise you're looking forward to or is there some music project you want to move on or maybe even sports because I think sports is uh, has a lot of uh, different uh, interesting aspects in the future as well yeah I um, I uh, got the opportunity to work with a gallery that does a lot of sports um, posters which I think is kind of a in a way, um, you know, I can't speak directly to it because I don't have a lot of sports posters in my home. But uh, I, working on them, I, it's a it's a totally different genre, and it has a totally different audience than this pop culture, um, mm -hmm. the movie and pop culture posters yeah. does. But the fans are just as rabid about the content. Um, so I got to work on a, um, a couple of sports related pieces. Um, so I would I would love to continue working I think in that vein I like um, is there certain, I like that it's, is there a certain sport you want to tackle or since like your your uh, wife is in is, is or an ex volleyball player volleyball um, I I think um, uh, my son being a baseball player I, I'm mm -hmm. I've got a big focus on baseball right now okay. I did a uh, an MLB piece for um, Gallery 1988. Mm -hmm. Uh, which uh, gave me a good chance to um, pay tribute to you know where I'm from. So I did the the Baltimore Orioles. Okay, um, that was a licensed piece, so it came with you know the bonus of having little hologram stickers on it. And, oh, cool! Um, it's it's just it's very exciting, I think, to work with um, real people mm -hmm. who their celebrity is them is themselves. You know, they yeah. are the, the sports star is the product. So. Um, uh, yeah, working uh, baseball. I think basketball. If I would, if I was able to mm -hmm. go back to some of the players that I admired as a kid, um, I like to uh, kind of introduce my my son now um, to some of the uh, things that made stuff great like 20 years ago. Like I, he knows who Dwayne the Rock Johnson is. Okay, right? so you But, so, so you basically show him Last Dance. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like I, I'm like. You want to know why Michael Jordan is so great? Um, here's a video of him shooting a free throw with his eyes closed in the middle of a game mm. and making a shot. And like, uh, and you know, you want to know who uh, The Rock was before he was, you know, international <laughs> movie star. Here is The Rock when he was very young, dropping what is called the people's elbow. Oh yeah, I remember that. <laughs> he goes, "What? He was th he was this guy too? Yeah, I mean, it was just like so." I think going back to those things is kind of a logical step in um, in popular culture. Is mm -hmm. you know, let's go back and investigate um, music. Let's go back and investigate sports and and see what kind of content is there. Mm -hmm. um, there are some galleries doing a pretty good job at sports and music right now. Did you um, did you see the the cards that Matt Taylor and some some other people did? They had like this baseball cards. Oh yeah, I'm currently co I'm I'm collecting some of those tops cards. Yeah, um, I think that's I think that's a great series. Um, uh, yeah, it's uh, that type of thing. I, I think tops is really on to something. Mm -hmm. um, getting um, artists who are well known in a field other than uh, sports memorabilia and having them reimagine these things, yeah. I think, is a really good step to take, and it brings in a whole another audience to this thing. Like people will go. 
Well, I'm not really a big fan of uh, Cal Ripken Jr., mm -hmm. but Matt Taylor did a Cal Ripken Jr. car. I need so that. I think I'm going to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, so I, yeah, I'm mm -hmm. already into that. I think I have four or five. Or I'm waiting for them to ship. Okay. It's a, Very it's a good. time decision thing. Yeah. Yeah. How, how much? How much were they, by the way? I, I didn't see it. Like the cards. Yeah. I wonder how much uh, was one are, card. They are twenty dollars okay. for each card. They have like AP versions, which I don't know what that means, but they have twenty APs okay. of each card, and those are three hundred dollars a piece. Oh, okay. Yeah. So uh, it's it's interesting um, uh, to see because I. I can see what they're doing. They're they are really preying upon people who are collectors of these things. So what they'll do is they'll mm -hmm. release the card for 14 days, and so yeah. there's a countdown. So you know when you're about to lose it. Okay. So you buy it, and then there's another website that tells you out of the 14 days how many were sold for that particular. So the ones Ooh, like okay. you know you'll get like Mike Trout wow. was was 14 days and they sold 90,000 cards, and then you'll go and they had. Jackie Robinson for 14 days and yeah. sold 25,000 cards. Yeah. So you like now you can tell kind of relatively wow. what value of what you're buying. Yeah, that's so crazy. It's like a whole another a whole another thing to Interesting, get interesting, yeah. Okay, um one of my favorite questions I always like to ask the artist is uh, which classical artist would you like to see uh, make a movie poster? <laughs> I've I've always been as an illustrator, I'm, I've always been a huge fan of the uh, Renaissance masters. <laughs> I know that sounds a little predictable, but... Um, no, it's fine. It's fine. If you were to go back and say, I, I think if if you were to go back and, like, let's say you go to Da Vinci and you say, I, I need you to do this poster, I think because of his, like, brilliance and kind of effortless perfection, mm -hmm. it would be a very simple thing. If you went then over to like Michelangelo and said, I need you to create this poster, mm. <laughs> I believe he would probably loathe the process yeah. but be very, very good at it. <laughs> How, what, what, what would he do? I mean, I, I pulled up uh, like uh, the, the Holy Family um, painting right, of and him. I, and uh, what kind of franchise would he do or which kind of movie? I think um, he would, I don't know if he, because his stuff is so figure it's figure it's uh, like he he works i don't know if he necessarily works in represented representational drawing mm -hmm. um so like his portraiture maybe not so much so i would imagine he would be able to interpret subject matter um in a very figural way like he would uh, very dynamic posing of characters and um his color choices obviously are very like dramatic mm -hmm. it's like you know, I'm mixing blues with hot pinks and like yellows and oranges. And, um, but the way that he, um, kind of frames things like I, I did, um, I mentioned it to you earlier, but I did a series for my first small group show at mm -hmm. 88 where I literally paid homage to Michelangelo with a series that I did called Sistine pop, yeah. which has various, um, pop culture characters seated in the like the thrones that he did that are all around the border of the uh, Sistine Chapel. Yeah. Um, so I did a series like that in the hopes of sort of introducing the concept of, you know, what, how would like a Renaissance yeah. master tackle kind of the subject matter that we have today. So like Optimus Prime sitting in a Sistine <laughs> Chapel throne is like, uh, I take that. Absurd, but yeah, I think it. I think it worked, but like I would. Or did, he's always been a personal favorite of mine because he was. I imagine him being so temperamental. Or I could. So I, I could imagine the Tiger King. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god, he'd be like grumbling the entire time about how stupid it was. That was crazy, huh? <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, that I think yeah, that's a great question. But yeah, I would I would love to see one of them tackle and just utterly kill like the print and just make it. It'd be so awesome. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so we're almost uh, down to our last question, and okay. uh, now we're at the beginners beginners tips. Um, you already mentioned a couple aspects of what to look for and I was wondering right. if you have in terms of hardware, software or utensils that should be used or even social media. What uh, I mean, social media, we touched a little bit, but you can elaborate on that if you want to. 
Yeah, we did. I mean, I think um, for beginners, I, I definitely would say invest the time in putting your portfolio online. I think it's uh, it's basically a business card for artists um, because the, the medium is, is visual by its nature. So uh, the fastest, easiest way to get all of your work or the pieces that you like in front of somebody is to have a website. So get yourself a website. Get yourself, I think Instagram is my preferred. Instagram is my preferred tool as an artist to get my work in front of uh, a large audience. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, you know, other social media uh, like Twitter and Facebook, but Instagram's the best and most instant way, I think, to display visual work. Um, I, uh, I touched upon uh, getting yourself a, um, a tablet. I think if you can get your hands on a, on a Cintiq or even an Intuos from Wacom, I would strongly strongly suggest doing it. I think um, working digitally is um, very freeing as far as giving you the ability to undo mistakes, fix things uh, in post very quickly. Um, what are you what is what are your stance on for example like the the Surface Book or the Surface Studio kind of drawing capabilities or the iPad? Um, I, um, I was always curious about using the iPad as a way to kind of like mobily work. Um, I, um, I wasn't sure what type of files you get kicked out of it. Like when you're done with a piece, mm. what can you do with it? Because I, I wonder, I mean, uh, you, they, I think most of the people work either with procreate where you can do a lot. And then there's yeah. also, um, the Adobe Fresco, which probably fits in with, the. Uh, with Photoshop or Illustrator or whatever, so you probably can interact. Yeah. As, as long as I could get a file out of it that I could um, color separate and get mm -hmm. to a printer, I think it's worthwhile. Um, I, I am so um, married to my desk and my process mm -hmm. of working, like, you know, in, in my space that going outside is kind of like, you know, why would I, why would I yeah. do that? I, I, I'm not going to work on a piece in the middle of a convention center during a con. It's just, yeah. it's too distracting. It's not where I'm comfortable. I think that's maybe where, maybe when, when you have like, let's say you, you study it at university or something like that and you take it with you. I think that's a good chance to do, to do work, I guess. And are there any utensils you like any pens or any, uh, maybe actually say, Hey, do analog work to practice yeah, or something uh, like that. For analog work I do, um, I use uh, Micron pens because um, I'm a stickler for tight lines. Um, <laughs> I also have a Japanese brush pen. I dabble with it. I think it's great for like this uh, this ink stuff. Like uh, uh, what's his name? Greg Ruth does. Uh, yeah, like I've got um, this pen here. It's oh, okay. A Japanese oh, brush. Oh, pen. this kind of okay. I got it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the tip is is it works. Yeah, like yeah. I, I know. Yeah, I know. What you're saying you can streak it and splatter it, and and it it's not as like the Microns are just. You know, it's like the micron is so, it's a needle point. So you're really, you don't get any free mistake. Like there are no mistakes that are being made unless, you know, it's a very literal mistake. With the brush <laughs> pens, you can intentionally have imperfection. Yeah. And it makes for, I think, a more interesting piece. I also use um, uh, Copic markers mm -hmm. are a great way to kind of get a watercolor effect but control it a little bit better. Yeah. I do like to work with watercolor um, because I, I like, uh, like I said, I, I like to add some bit of, uh, of imperfection to the piece just so it's not so stale. Yeah. Um, uh, so watercolor gives you that ability to just keep, you know, get it really wet and let it run and see what it does when it dries. So I mm. think it, it gives you that one of a kind feel. Um, and then, uh, I do, uh, some like charcoal and, uh, pastel work on paper, mm -hmm. um, using the tinted stocks, like a brown paper or a gray paper, mm -hmm. uh, gives you the opportunity to, uh, invest some time in, uh, white, like white, uh, a pencil and that type of thing. I think, um, it creates a more dynamic piece. Yeah. Um, so like what Gabs does, that one behind you, the John Wick there is like mm -hmm. a perfect example. It's tinted paper. It's, he's using both lights and darks and drawing both, um, mm. which, uh, yeah, I, I just like, I love to, to keep doing originals and, and, you know, work with my hands, yeah. but the, the way to, uh, to, 
do that same to have that same feel is is to work with a tablet um, and draw like you would. Um, there's a lot of great brushes out there. I can't um, suggest enough to uh, get like the uh, the the Kyle T Webster set of brushes. Yeah, I heard a lot of people talking about those brushes. Yeah, um, Gabs turned me on to him initially, um, but he has since gotten a job with Adobe because his brushes are so good. Mm -hmm. um, you can get, um, they're pressure sensitive, they're uh, angle sensitive, they're, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, if, if you experiment with them, you can get extremely realistic brush effects that okay. feel uh, just like the real thing. Crazy. Um, so yeah, I would, I would definitely suggest that. And obviously, you know, I'm a, I'm an Adobe jockey from a long time ago, so uh, I've been using Photoshop mm -hmm. and Illustrator for a long time. Um, I think it's it's the best way to work. Uh, the files <laughs> are the best. Uh, yeah, I can't. I, it just it gives you. Uh, it's it's the right tool for especially for this um, for screen print work. Okay, and uh, you mentioned something about uh, convention kind of stuff. I I, yeah. I pulled up that photo. What what, what did you wanted to say something about that? So. Uh, which photo was it? Uh, it's a workspace eight with, uh, oh, 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 that, um, I got a, um, a suggestion from, um, um, uh, from another artist who does a lot of conventions, mm -hmm. uh, probably a dozen or more a year. And his suggestion was to, um, get yourself these, um, um, acoustic cases, mm -hmm to protect your um, paper during transport. And uh, having the, um, the dolly wheels and the way that it locks and it's hard, it's a hard case. Mm -hmm. There's no fear of uh, getting soft corners or edges uh, getting torn or anything like that. Um, but I, uh, I invested in um, this, uh, there's a larger acoustic case mm -hmm. there which holds my um, 18 by 24 prints in kind of that box uh, portfolio, upright portfolio. Um, and, uh, and then the smaller ones for the smaller prints. But, um, if you have interest in going to cons, um, then, you know, for any artist, I would suggest getting, getting yourself a nice, sturdy, rollable case in order to get in and out of there, um, without <laughs> damaging your, your goods. Um, so yeah, I, I just wanted to, I just wanted to show these because, um, it was, yeah, it was, uh, it was daunting to try to figure out how to get so much yeah. paper into uh, space, um, but this is really um, taking the headache out of that. And I, yeah, don't worry about it anymore. Okay, very good. Okay, um, so we are uh, at the last part of the show, which is okay. you can give shout outs uh, to anybody you like, family, friends, um, your kids, other artists, <laughs> go ahead, feel free. You have uh, l some time. Not all the time in the world, but sometime. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would just like to give a, um, a shout out to uh, um, the guys over at Spoke Art. Uh, they've been fantastic to work with for the last, I think, 12 years. Um, yeah. Gallery 1988 has been fantastic. Uh, Nakatomi and Tim Doyle has been a huge supporter of my work. Um, Shout out to my kids, Jack and Tori, my wife, Victoria. Um, and I guess um, if you want to look at my work, I have everything that I've ever done since 2008 on my website at joshuabudich.com. But the place to look for um, crops of things I'm working on, uh, process videos, um, originals, and other promotion is uh, my Instagram account, which is uh, jbudich. Is my tag over there. Perfect. Yeah, I, I will definitely link all of that in uh, the show notes and uh, the, the, the caption and all of that. And uh, do you have also a YouTube channel maybe for the, like the, the stuff you do? Or is that? No, that's a great idea. Okay, I, I did there you go. I've done a Facebook <laughs> live video before okay. for a small Facebook group, but yeah. But yeah, so so basically, I showed you how uh, like th this the program I'm using uh, for the live editing that does the trick for uh, you can basically stream it live. We could have done all this live to YouTube. Oh, that's awesome! So yeah, this, this yeah. is a way to to do it. Because um, yeah, there's a lot of uh, apparently the uh, the young kids are not like the teenagers are getting into people doing Copic marker drawings yeah. on YouTube. That's that's what uh, um, Tom Whalen did. He sold them. Yeah. Did you see that? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm just like, I'm surprised, but I, I've done some uh, art tutoring for some uh, young folks um, 
around where we live mm -hmm. and they're all mm -hmm. like why you have so many copic markers that's awesome i love copics i'm like you've heard of copic markers <laughs> like, weird huh the deal? <laughs> <laughs> so uh yeah i mean i would yeah i would love to do live drawing i've done one and it was it's hard to talk and draw at the same time but it was it went pretty well mm -hmm. um yeah, yeah. dolly did that also from time to time he did a couple um uh live drawings and greg does it with muddy colors i think they do some kind of work like that so yeah there's this i think there's a market for it and people really enjoy this kind of stuff and yeah maybe uh, maybe off camera we can we can figure something out <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, uh, thank you for stopping by, Josh. Uh, Josh, it was really a pleasure. And thanks to all the listeners out there and uh, also the viewers. Tune in for our next episode uh, in the next week. It's going to be a release episode and in two weeks, another interview episode. And check us out on uh, Instagram under at official and uh, subscribe on YouTube as well for the videos. We enjoy giving you great content. Take care, guys. Bye.